Morning. Welcome to Open Door Church. My name is Ali. And uh, today I thought today would be the good day to dust off my 30-year-old sweater. And uh, <laughs> believe it or not, this won me the ugly sweater contest a couple years ago. Um, so today I'm going to be doing a reading from 2 Timothy 3, lines 10 through 17. Now you follow my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will, per will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And from, in that, from the childhood you have known, and the sacred writings which you are able to give, you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped with every good deed. So, as Christians, you know that life is not perfect for all of us. And at time to time, you'll, you're going to come with things that uh, you're not going to be able to handle. So, sometimes it just uh, keeps on coming. And, uh, you know, that uh, Rohan is dealing with uh, his father uh, with uh, a tumor in his head. And he had surgery. And you think that's the end of it. But then his mom comes down with a lump and they do a biopsy and it comes back negative and you're all excited. And then you do another biopsy and it comes back negative and you're all excited. And then they tell you, well, we're going to have to have surgery as a possibility there's cancer there. So then you have Mary who's dealing with Sister Barbara who has cancer and is going through treatment and things don't sound so great. And, but most importantly, that uh, we're all praying for her salvation. And then you have <clears throat> yesterday afternoon, my mom shows up at the store, gets out of the truck, her van, van rolls back. She, 77 years old, tries to stop it. She gets pinned underneath it. And thank God that, uh, you know, that uh, it worked out okay. She's okay. She's at the hospital. She cracks some ribs. So you can look at all those things and see all the negatives. <clears throat> or you can see all the great things that have occurred from it and all the things that have happened, um, where it happened and why it happened. She happened to be at the store where she had all the help in the world, where people were around her to witness it and get the help that she needed. And all within 20 minutes, the whole thing was over and she was on her way to, in the ambulance back to Pittsfield. Now you can say why these things happened, but as Christians, you're thankful and grateful for all the great things that have happened from it and where it happened. That could have happened at her house where she lives basically by herself and she would have been pinned there all day long. So, um, you know, she has, Barbara has uh, her sister Mary, who put her on a prayer list. She has this whole church and many people praying for her. And then you have Rohan, um, his parents, um, or, you know, his parents are got to be very thankful and grateful to have a son like him who's traveling back and forth to take care of his parents. And he's, you know, he's got a future daughter-in-law daughter -in there that uh, right on his side. And God willing, it'll be a daughter-in-law pretty soon as long as Rohan stops dragging his feet. Uh, and, uh, so, no pressure or anything. Uh, so, so with that being said, as Christians, you know, we have the Lord to, to, uh, to bend a knee to every night and ask for guidance and direction through all of this. And uh, so take advantage of it, um, you know, for all those that are struggling with these things. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy to get lost in the important things. And, uh, you know, he's always there for you. Just take advantage of it and bear down on it as I do every night. Because I can tell you it's, uh, it's not easy and it just keeps on coming. So with all that being said, please join me in prayer. 
I want to thank you, Father, for this church and all who are here today. I want to thank you, Father, for being there with us as we deal with our struggles every day, each of us in their own way, um, dealing with things, Father. And uh, I'm glad and thankful to, to be able to lean on you for all things, for guidance and direction. And it is your Son, Jesus, Father, who paid that price on that cross for us all. No matter who we are, Father, we're able to come before you with our struggles. And at times, Father, when things are going well, we give you the glory and praise for them. You are a great God, Father, and I hope and pray that uh, those that are struggling every day, Father, truly see the light in their situation and come before you and bend a knee, whether it's in repentance, whether it's in thanksgiving, whether it's for guidance and direction. May you continue, Father, to bless this church, our community, and all who are here today. In the name of your Son. Amen. 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 I was dead in my transgressions, wandering in sin. I went searching for redemption down a road that had no end. I was walking through the fire. I was living on the run with my flesh lost in desire. I was drowning in. God.
Good morning. All of you guys come up close to me so that you can hear. You know, your parents have to work. Does anybody know why they work? Why do they work? Because to get money. To get money. All right. Now, I heard somebody say one time that they worked for peanuts. <laughs> but you know what? I think they were kidding, right? That meant they didn't make much money. They worked for peanuts. They didn't make much. But I thought about that this week, and I thought, you know, I love bananas so much. What if, what if they paid me in bananas? How would that be? That'd be all right? Because if everybody loved bananas the way I do, then I could... I could go pay my mortgage with bananas, right? I could pay for my car with bananas. I could do all that. So I brought some bananas with me today. So I thought, all right, let's get the bananas. Now, somebody tell me how many bananas I have. Who can count? Who can count? How many, how many do you see there? Um, ten. You are exactly right, and you said it just perfectly. That's great. So, so that's how many I have. But you know, if we think about bananas and we think about uh, that being what we make, think about what parents have to do. Think about what they do. Maybe they have to pay their taxes, right? And let's say that cost them two bananas, right? Got to pay you taxes or you're in a bunch of trouble. And what else do they have to pay? They have to pay for their house, right? So let's put two more bananas and say that they can pay for their house with two more bananas. What else do they have to pay for? What else do they have to pay for, Calvin? Car. Their car. How many bananas is that? Maybe one banana for a car. What else do they have to pay for? Their job. Their job. For what? Their job. <laughs> their job. Okay, they may have expenses like that. They have to pay for food, right? Because they can't just eat bananas, can they? All right, so let's say that they have to take two more bananas and they have to pay for their food. What else do they have that they have to pay for? What? Their beds. Their beds? So yeah, they got, they got expenses like clothes and beds and everything. And you like to have a little money so you can just go do what you want to do, right? Yeah, we like that. So they take their other bananas and they go spend it on what they want. If I spent my money on, if I spent my bananas on all those things, how much money do I have left for God? Zero. Zero. Is that good? No. No. You know what the Bible said? The Bible said when you get your ten bananas, the first thing you do is you take your very first banana and you give that to God. Did you know that? That's what the Bible says. And then you can pay your taxes, and you can pay your for your house, and you can pay for your clothes and your food, and you can pay for all of that with what's left. But you see, God got the first banana. You think that's the best way? That's what the Bible says. Give him the first banana, and then he says, you'll have all the bananas that you need to take care of everything else, because he's going to bless you for that. Does that make sense? All right, so always remember, he gets the first banana. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the children. Thank you for teaching them here at the church. Thank you for those who are going to be teaching them now. Just pray that you will bless them as they go to their classes and bless all of us as we learn more about you and what you want for us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So if you like bananas like I do, these will be back at the fellowship time, okay?
Testament for the last 18 months. We have seldom departed from it. Well, today we're at the end of that particular journey. Next week we're going to begin for 18 months in the New Testament. Maybe beyond that, but certainly for that period of time. In fact, the next nine months we're going to be talking about the life of Christ. But it's appropriate that we end our study of the Old Testament with the last book in the Old Testament, the last of the Old Testament prophets, Malachi. Now we know very little about this prophet. We do know that he ministered to the people of Israel about 430 years before Christ was born. Now, as the prophet delivers God's word, the people respond. You know, people usually do respond when you speak to them. You know how they responded? They responded by arguing with him. Have you ever had anybody do that? You speak to them and they don't like what you have to say. Well, they think what they're doing is taking exception to what Malachi is saying. What they're actually doing is taking exception to what God was saying to them through Malachi. In fact, the word, the name Malachi means my messenger. Need I point out to you that it is a dangerous thing when people argue with God. It is an argument that you cannot win when you try to defend your sinful ways. Now, I learned that early in my life by example from my parents, especially from my mom. You see, when I was a child, my parents expected something of me. In fact, they insisted on that something from me. Above all else, what they expected and insisted upon was respect, that I had to respect my parents. Now that respect was to be demonstrated by me in all that I said when I talked to them. It was in not only what I said to them, but the way in which I said it to them. Any of you that have children know what I'm talking about. And the way that I responded to what they told me. Now much of what they told me was given to me in terms of demands or commands. In other words, they set the rules, and it was my duty as a child to follow those rules. Now, on those occasions when I dared to ignore those rules, I got punished. That punishment took very many different forms, and I will not uh, go into those, even though they still sting a bit. But that built into me a healthy respect and a proper understanding of my relationship to my parents. Now, when I was no longer a child, my parents still had the right to expect something of me. I still owed them my respect. No longer did they enforce that expectation through punishment, but there was no reason for them to have to do so. Because a proper relationship with them was still dependent upon a response of respect. Certainly a child owes that to their parents as long as they're around. Now there are many adults today who are confused about their relationship with their parents. They think that any obligation of respect toward their parents has ceased. Since their parents can no longer enforce the expectation of respect, they feel like it's okay not to give it to them any longer. The result of that is heartbreak for the parents and the loss of blessings for the son or for the daughter. Now there should be no time in our lives when our parents are dearer to us than in our maturity. Would you agree with that? Likewise, there are many believers today who are confused about their relationship with God. They know about the law of God and they know about the demands of that law. They also have heard about the grace of God and know about it and the freedom that there is in that. And they learned that we are no longer under the law, but we are now under grace, and that is a wonderful thing. But these believers are confused. They believe that somehow they have no obligation to the law of God. Let me remind you what the New Testament says about the law of God. It tells us that it served a very, it served and serves a very important purpose in our lives in bringing us to Christ. Galatians 3.24 says, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. 
so that we may be justified by faith. Now the law declared to us the righteous standards of God and showed us how far short we fell of those standards. And that opened us up to the truth of Christ so that we would be willing to put all of our hope in Him. And when we did, our relationship with the law changed because Paul goes on in Galatians 3 and says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In other words, what faith did was it set us free from the penalties of the law. But let me say to you this morning that the principles upon which the law was established did not change. Now as you read the Old Testament and you learn of the many ways in which the people of Israel were to worship God, ways, many of those ways which we no longer follow, you would be wise to look for the principle being taught through the practice. The practices may have changed, but the principles have not. Because you know that we serve a God who does not change. And that brings us to today's message. It concerns the matter that preachers are reluctant to speak about because so many people say all they talk about is money. And that's not true. Go back and listen to all my sermons on Facebook, whatever. See how often I talk about money. But I am thankful that, uh, that it is in this church to where I don't know what anybody gives to the church. I have no idea who gives and what they give. All right? Now, I like it that way because then I can look at all of you and just uh, know that, uh, uh, that it's not my business. It is between you and God. But whenever I knew that I was going to preach on tithing, I made sure not to send that out, an email, out in an email lest somebody who really needs this message might stay home. Okay? So I didn't warn people ahead of time, and I am impressed that when you looked at the bulletin, because I'm sure when you pick up the bulletin, the first thing you do is you go and look at my outline there in the bulletin and see what it is I'm going to be preaching about. But when you saw that, you didn't bolt for the door and say, mm, I think I'll skip this Sunday. Well, the people of Israel were like believers today. They tried to ignore this principle, and I'm sure they had many excuses like believers do today. I am sure that they tried to reason that God was not interested in what they might bring out of their increase, that all He was interested in was their heart. But is one not the reflection of the other? The word tithe literally means a tenth. The people of Israel were to bring 10% of their harvest of crops and the increase in their flocks, those being the measure of their income, to the temple. Now it was my mother who taught me about tithing. Why did she do that? She did that because she wanted me to obey God. Now the one reason that she wanted me to obey God was because God is God. And the other reason that she wanted me to obey God in this was because she wanted me to be blessed. In fact, if you have your Bible open to Malachi chapter 3, let me just read to you the best verse out of this passage I'm going to be preaching on today. It is verse 10. It says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. You see, my mother wanted me to experience that. She wanted me to know the blessings of God. So as we look at this text, I want you to look for the principles to understand the principles that are related to us in this text in regard to the practice of tithing. First, notice what we will describe as the crime. Look at verse 7 in chapter 3 of Malachi. It says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? God answers and says, Will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now the nations that surrounded Israel were pagan nations. They built for themselves gods of wood or stone or clay. They then built temples and altars and shrines to those gods. 
As we look back at them, we wonder how they could ever be as deceived as they were. And yet, though they were worshiping false gods, those pagans had such a respect for their gods that those nations did not need to have a banking system. You see, instead, their treasures were deposited in these temples where no thief would dare to enter for fear of the gods. So the money, the goods, were safe in the temple. It must have shocked the Israelites to hear God's accusation through Malachi. The very thought of stealing something from God. They knew that they had not entered his temple and removed anything, and so they asked the question, how have we robbed you? God answers in tithes and offerings. In other words, it was not what they had taken from the house of God, but what they had failed to bring to the house of God. Now, tithing did not come about as an expression of obligation to God. It came about as an expression of gratitude to God. 400 years before the law was given to Israel, God led Abraham. He put it in Abraham's heart to give a tithe to Melchizedek, the priest of Jerusalem, out of what he had gained from a particular military effort. 150 years later, Jacob pledged to show his gratitude to God through the giving of a tithe. God, you bless me, I'll give you 10%. Now, our words of thanks to God, while withholding the tithe, paying our bills with it, or spending that money on ourselves, rather than entrusting it to God through the local church to further the work of God, must be about like the Christianity that James spoke of in James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, where he said this, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Is it too much of a stretch to say to you, show me your acknowledgement of God's ownership of all that you have and your faith without your tithing, and I will show you my acknowledgement of God's ownership of all that I have and my faith that He will meet all of my needs through my tithing. How can we say that we trust God and yet we do not trust Him in relation to our finances? How can that be? Now those who would argue that they are not obligated to the paying of a tithe should demonstrate their freedom by giving more than a tithe. You ought to give more. You say, well, I'm the, old, the 10 percent is an Old Testament. Well, should we do less under grace than we did under the law? Should we look for excuses for not tithing? Shall we do less in showing our gratitude for God's provision in this day of grace? Now, I can't imagine that such a response is pleasing to God. Now, ingratitude itself is despised in every culture with which I'm aware. Yet, when a man refuses to honor God through the sacrificial giving of at least a tithe, it is ingratitude, ingratitude, that is written in capital letters. You know that in my background, all of us have a background, right? In my background, I was an IRS agent. And they had to pay me money to go out and make sure that people didn't get away with cutting corners on their taxes, right? And it is the part of the American ideal that it is our right to take our taxes and put them at the very minimum they can legally be, right? I mean, you know, that's the way CPAs make their money is trying to get your tax burden down, try to get it cut down. And there are Christians that approach the giving of the tithe in the same way. How much can I get away with? What's the minimum that I can pay and still be pleasing to God? What's the least I can do 
People used to ask me a question that they don't often ask me now, and that was uh, because I was working in an area where that uh, most people drew a paycheck as far as a weekly paycheck where they withdraw your taxes and withdraw your uh, income tax and all of that. And they asked me the question, said, well, pastor, do we pay our tithe on the gross or on the net? In other words, we do it before Uncle Sam gets his part or after. What's the answer? You know what I told him? I told him, you know, God is faithful. He's more faithful than the credit card companies, you know. It wasn't long ago that I paid off a credit card bill and, and then I took something that I'd bought on that credit card back to the store, back to Home Depot, and, got, and they gave me a credit back on that card. I didn't use that card anymore. And then I got a check back for the amount of that because eventually they saw that I wasn't going to charge anymore and they sent me a check. You see, I overpaid them, right? They were faithful to send it back to me. Do you think you can overpay God? Do you think He's not faithful to send you back something if you've paid a little bit too much? I don't believe in minimum Christianity. I don't believe that we ought to say, how much can I get by with? Some people say, well, I can get by with zero because it's not expected of you anymore. Well, I want to tell you, if that's your attitude, then you've got a problem. I would argue that nobody robs God and really prospers. It has rightly been said, every penny that is withheld from God's treasury is put into a bag that is full of holes. Let's look further. I want you to notice the cover-up. It says in verse 9, You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now, anybody who is a thief learns to plan his escape. Now, if we were sure that, if that thief were sure that he would be captured, that he would be tried, and that he would be condemned, he would never break into a house. It should be simple to understand that no man can hope to escape when he robs God. Verse 11 of our text speaks of the devourer. Part of the curse that comes with robbing God is that God allows your goods to be wasted. Maybe through medical bills, maybe through unwise purchases, but always wasted. Folks, let me say to you, the wisest financial decision that you can make is to, is to ask God to show you how you can give back to Him at least a tenth of what He has provided to you. That's the wisest decision that you can make. As I said, many people think that tithing is no longer expected by God. Well, I would say that if that is true, then God has, ab has abandoned an excellent teaching tool. For one principle that is taught by tithing is the principle of stewardship, that God owns everything. Read the Old Testament, and you will see God teaching His people that, that He's the owner of everything. All we are is stewards of what actually belongs to God. Now, the Israelite acknowledged that principle by giving to God a tenth of all that God blessed him to receive. Giving that tenth acknowledged God's ownership of the whole. A second principle being taught was the principle of the first fruits. The Israelite was not to wait and see what he had left over to give to God. And I'm afraid that's what Christians do today. They come to Sunday and they say, I wish I could give more. Problem? Problem. Because God should be given the first. And these are New Testament truths. What did Jesus tell the Pharisee who very meticulously gave exactly a tenth but omitted mercy and faith? He said this, these are the things you should have done. He's talking about giving the tithe. You should have done this without neglecting the others. So tithing by itself is not enough, but Jesus said it ought to be done. You know that the Apostle Paul calls giving a grace in eight different passages. It is an outflow of the grace of God in our hearts. Love should lead us to do more than just tithe. Now those who do not give at least a tithe and yet try to act all spiritual about it, arguing they live under grace and not under law, you know what they're doing? They're simply covering up their, for their crime. The challenge. Look again at verse 10. Bring the whole tithe 
all 10%, he said, into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. You know what God is doing with his people? He is challenging us to trust Him. This verse tells us that when we do not trust Him, there will be a crisis in the work of the kingdom. Now, I would agree with those who say God does not need our money. The problem is, it's His money. It's His. But the ministry God intends to do through the local church will suffer for lack of of that gift. God's plan is to provide for the, His work in the world through the tithe. I looked it up. On the average, those who say that they are Christians give, and this is an old number, this is from four or five years ago, it may be less today, but on the average, Christians, people who identify as Christians give 2.5% of their income to churches. Do you know that during the Great Depression, the average was 3.3%? In our day of affluence, in our day of plenty, Christians give less than they did during the Depression. Today, at least 80% of evangelical Christians don't tithe. And because of that, those that we are to reach around the world are starving spiritually. You see, the first thing most churches cut back on when offerings are down, you know what it is? They cut the missions out of the budget. They cut the missions back in the budget. Even here in our own community, we are handicapped from doing more to reach the people because of lack of funds that should not be. You know, God challenges us to trust Him. In Proverbs 10, 22, it says, It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich, and He adds no sorrow to it. God will bless you so that you will never regret investing in His kingdom, but the blessing is in the trusting. I remember as a child this lesson, and I remember the first time, and I've shared it with some of you, that God gave me the opportunity to earn $3. I had to work hard for $3. This was back in the 50s. I had to work hard for because I was working for my brother. And you know, brothers are not real generous with you. He got a job. He was going to be paid $10. I did all the work. I got $3. He got $7. We're sitting on his backside and doing nothing. But I was thankful for that $3. And you know what the first thing was that I did with that money? I gave 30 cents to the church that week that came out of my money, and I was blessed by it. I looked forward to that. I was encouraged by that. I finally had some money of my own. Now, I am not rich in earthly goods, but I am rich. I have learned to trust God for my daily needs, and folks, that is a wealth that comes without sorrow. He tells us in verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Well, I believe in what I call storehouse tithing. That means that the tithe is to be brought to the place where we worship for the Israelites, that was the temple. For us, that is the local church. There are many good causes out there, many things that you could divert your tithe to those causes, but there is no cause like the ministry of the local church, and certainly we as a church should be supporting ministries outside the church. He said in verse 10, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. I trust that you will accept that challenge to trust the Lord in this very practical matter which God has placed before us this day. Very practical matter. Because you see, you need to understand my motivation. My motivation in sharing this is not a selfish motivation unless my concern for you is a selfish motivation. Because what I want to do is to be like my mom was with me. I want you to know the blessings of God. Notice the commitment. Verse 11. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. So God's commitment to you is to meet your needs through the blessing of your labor. But notice that there is something even more important than this, which is at stake. Look at verse 12. All the nations 
will cause you call you blessed for you shall be a delightful land says the Lord of hosts you see what this is saying to us is that tithing is an opportunity to show the Lord the world how much we love the Lord to show the world how much we love the Lord it declares a great submission and it declares a great love for God the world will not understand it but they will recognize God's blessing on you because of it. Now, your tithe allows God to use the church to minister to those in need and to support ministries to, the, to, uh, ministries to those who need. It provides funds for the sending of missionaries. It allows us to minister within the community. Without that, what would we do? Now, our witness is in trouble because so many of us will not allow God to have first place in our finances. There is a person of some years in our church that any time that she misses, she makes sure to send a check and it says on their tithe. She, like me, learned a long time ago the blessings of God. And every time I see that, I'm humbled and I'm grateful. I'm thankful for that. Our witness is so very important. I would venture a guess and would have little fear of being wrong, even though I don't know what any of you give, that our offerings would at least double if every person who calls this church their church would give the minimum of the tithe. And if our offerings doubled, we could be a greater blessing to the people of our community and we could have a greater impact on the nations of the world. As long as I'm alive, we'll never be the church that just takes it and hoards it up in the bank so that we have all the money we'll ever need. We have this great endowment fund so that, so that we don't have to worry about anybody giving for a long, long time. I think that is detrimental. It keeps the church from operating by faith. We have faith to believe that God is going to touch the lives of the people. Now, this message that I've just preached to you can make certain people mad. If you're mad at me, don't look to me for an apology. Do not look to me for apology. Rather, I will simply pray that God will do a fresh work in your heart. You see, such a reaction as this, if this has caused your blood to boil a little bit, that's a warning sign that you have heart trouble. All right? And I'm concerned about if you've got heart trouble. This message may have made you sad. You see, God's convicted you of your lack of faith and faithfulness. Know that He will forgive you, just as He promises with any other sin. He will forgive you if you confess your sin to Him. And He will show you how you can obey Him in this matter of your finances. Now, this message may have made you glad. It's made you glad if you know the blessings of tithing. It's made you glad if you've been concerned that we have so many people that don't know that blessing. Let me say to all of you today, faith set us free from the penalties of the law, but the principles upon which the law was established did not change. And those, those principles which were taught through tithing must still be learned by the believer. And I would encourage you parents, teach your children as my mom taught me. Wouldn't it be great if you gave your kids an allowance for, you know, you give them allowance because you demand work of them, right? You don't give them allowance if they sit around and do nothing. If you give them an allowance because they're working, teach them the principle of tithing. Teach them the joy of giving a tenth to the Lord. Those principles need to be learned. And then those blessings that are associated with those principles will still be experienced by the believer. Now, I hope you understood that tithing is a spiritual matter and not just a financial matter. It is a matter of whether you have the faith to trust God in the very practical areas of your life. Well, where do you start? Well, the first place you start with any of this with God is to make sure that you're a child of His. You know, it wouldn't matter if you gave 50% of your income to the Lord if you don't have faith in Christ. If you've not given your life to Him, then your money means very little. 1 
first place to start is, do you know that you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know that you've trusted Him? If not, you need to start there. But that's just the start, that's not the finish. God has so much for you to learn, so much for you to apply, so much for you to be aware of in your Christian life. And oh, how He wants to bless you. Oh, how He wants to bless you. Our worship team is going to come and minister to us with music. And I'm going to ask you to just bow and seek God's face for this. It may be that you need to get alone with God right where you are. That you just need to open your heart and mind to Him and say, Oh God, help me to understand the truth of this. Help me to understand how this applies to me. Help me to understand what I am to do next in this regard. Help me to know how to give you that first out of my income. And God, I'll trust you to do what only you can do with that and bring the blessings. Will you trust Him today? Will you say to God, I see the principle. I believed those who said it wasn't important, but I, believe, I see the principle and I'm going to trust you right now with myself, with my life, with all. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, open that up to Him right now. Bow your heads, close your eyes. As this music is played, I'll be here at the front if you want me to pray with you. If not, pray where you are or come and kneel here at this empty front row if you want to. And just open your heart to the Lord.